peace and his presence this morning as we join in worship together. I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. So come, let us sing to the Lord, and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs of praise. Our opening hymn is hymn number 338, O Beautiful for Spacious Skies. Please be seated. In the assurance of God's love and grace, we make time at the beginning of every service of worship to confess our sin, our waywardness. And so let us do so now in the assurance of God's love for us. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, in what we have done and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Holy Spirit, and raise us to new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. We ask this through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Friends, hear this assuring word of the Lord from the first chapter of Isaiah. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel that in Christ Jesus our sins are forgiven and we are washed clean. We are made whole. We are white as snow. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. Now this morning let us stand. And let us share the peace of Christ with one another. You may be seated. Today is, of course, Sunday and the 4th of July weekend, and I hope you all have a good 4th this year and that you will celebrate, as we are called to, to celebrate the, the freedom of our nation and the sacrifices that have been made for it. Uh, this morning, uh, we are um, we're encouraged to give towards the Tazewell Ministerial Association Benevolence Fund. You don't have to do that this morning, but if you would like to make out a check uh, towards that end, it, it would be much appreciated. We don't have any children present this morning, um, and so... We will skip past the children's time. We do have two scripture readings, and uh, we in inadvertently left out the page number for the first reading, but it's Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 15. You may follow along as I read it to you from our pulpit Bible. The writer of Hebrews says this to the early church. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. As in my anger, I swore, they will not enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, 
so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, if you would turn with me to our second reading, our reading from Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. You may find it at page 752. Listen for the word of God to you and to the church. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and all gracious God, reveal to us now your will through your word, read and proclaimed, and then send us forth to do the work that you call each of us to do. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. When I was a kid, there was a TV show called Get Smart. You remember it? Maxwell Smart was a secret agent with the same skill as Inspector Clouseau. His sidekick was Agent 99. Maxwell Smart was always taking his shoe off to talk into the heel. He had a phone in there, and in every episode, he failed at his mission, but he would cover his failure with these words, missed it by that much. That's what he would say, missed it by that much. Well, I think there's a little bit of Maxwell smart in every one of us. We miss it sometimes. You know, I think, that the word sin in the Bible, the actual Hebrew word and the actual Greek word, literally means miss the mark. To sin is to miss the mark. John Calvin, the grandfather of Presbyterian theology, used to speak of human beings as examples of total depravity. Ugh, sounds just horrible. I mean, it's, it's hard not to argue that human beings have serious problems, but totally depraved? Are we totally depraved? Here's what Calvin meant. He didn't mean that we are absent of good. Not at all. What he meant by total depravity is that we know from our own experience that there is real and genuine goodness in people, but we also know that there is no one, no one of us, who is good all the time. Total depravity, in other words, means that we aren't pure. It's not that we can't be good. We can. It's not even that when we are good, we don't escape selfishness. We are good but we fall short. We miss it by that much. 
Wherever the line is drawn between good and evil, between acceptable and unacceptable, we're always walking on both sides of that line. Jonah did. Jonah was a prophet of God. He got some things right. He, as we go on in the story, we will see that he ends up going to to Nineveh against his better wishes, his, his wishes, but he goes eventually, and he does proclaim to the Ninevites the word that they were wicked. So he does do some things right, but boy, he messes up. And he doesn't just miss it by this much. He misses it by this much. His act of running away from God carries consequences. Consequences not only for himself, but for others. Especially, most particularly, for everyone on the boat. The text says, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And that that wind was so strong, so ferocious, that the ship was about to break into pieces. Last night, I saw a clip on TV about three three men who were being lifted up out of the sea in the South China Sea somewhere as a great storm hit and just just tore tore apart the ship that they were on. Those three survived, but another 23 were unaccounted for. Have you ever been caught in a storm out on open water? I asked that this morning in our, in our Bible study time, and, and uh, Pete Francisco shared a, a, a time that, was, uh, that he went through, and it was quite, quite dramatic. But have you been out on a lake, just a lake, and had the wind come up, and you're in a rowing boat or a speedboat or whatever, and it, it, you know, it's beating against the, the, the bow of the ship, the boat? Have you been out on a river when the wind came up? Have you been out on the ocean when a wind came up and it really rocked that boat? It's something you don't forget. No one comes off a storm at sea on open water. No one comes off a storm unshaken. Well, the text says that the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. The word hurled there is often used for throwing a weapon, like a spear. And so the picture here is of God throwing this mighty storm out on the sea against this boat, this ship. And it's called a great wind. The word translated great in our English translation is the Hebrew word gadola, which is the same word, interestingly, used in the narrative to describe the city of Nineveh. In other words, if Jonah refuses to go into the great city, the great city of Nineveh, he will go into a great storm. If I understand this text, I think one thing, I I think we can take away from it both dismaying and comforting news. The dismaying news is that every act of disobedience to God has a storm attached to it. This is one of the great themes of the Old Testament wisdom literature, especially in the book of Proverbs. We need to tread carefully here. This isn't to say that every difficult thing that comes into our lives is the punishment for some particular sin. Not at all. The book of Job contradicts that common belief that good people will have their lives go well, but that if your life is going badly, it must be your fault. Job puts that to rest. The Bible does not say that every 
difficulty is the result of sin. But it does teach that every sin will bring you into difficulty. If we violate the design and purpose of things, if we sin against our bodies, we don't take care of our bodies. If we sin against our relationships, if we we don't take care of our relationships in our family or relationships with friends, if we sin against society, they strike back. There are consequences. The Bible speaks sometimes about God punishing sin. Proverbs 16.5, for instance, says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. They will not go unpunished. But at other times, the Bible speaks of the sin itself punishing us. Proverbs 21.7 says, The violence of the wicked will drag them away, for they refuse to do right. That God punishes sin and that sin punishes us, both are true at the same time. Both are true at once. All sin has a storm attached to it. Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner states, sin sets up strains, strains in the structure of life, which can only end in breakdown." Generally speaking, liars are lied to, attackers are attacked, and he or she who lives by the sword dies by the sword. There is a spiritual givenness to our lives. Now here in the narrative of Jonah, the results of Jonah's disobedience are immediate and dramatic. The storm's suddenness and fury are so striking that the boat's sailors, who are pagans, they discern it to be of supernatural origin. But you know as well as I that more often the results of sin are like the physical response you have to the debilitating dose of radiation. You don't suddenly feel the pain the moment you are exposed. You only later experience the symptoms. Sin is like that. All sin has a storm attached to it. That's the dismaying news here. But I think there's comforting news too. When sin's storms come, whether they come of our own wrongdoing or they come because of somebody else's, we have the promise that God will use these storms for our good. When God wanted to make Abraham into a man of faith who could be the father of all the faithful on earth, God put him through years of wandering with apparently unfulfilled promises. When God wanted to turn Joseph from an arrogant, deeply spoiled teenager into a person of character, God put Joseph through years of rough handling. Joseph had to experience slavery and imprisonment before he could save his people. Moses had to become a fugitive and spend 40 years in lonely wilderness before he could lead. Abraham Lincoln had to experience deprivation, not only the loss of a mother, but the loss of several businesses, the loss of several political campaigns before he could become the president of the United States that we needed in a time of civil war. And you and I, every one of us, we learn from hardships. We learn from our failures. The Bible, as I said, does not say that every difficulty is the result of our sins, but it does teach that for people of faith, every difficulty, every, even difficulties that are the result of our own sin, can help develop in us faith, hope, love, patience, and self-control. Storms can develop these things in us like nothing else. But as hard as it is sometimes to discern any loving and wise purpose in those trials, those difficulties, those storms in our life, 
Remember, we have the promise that God can use them for our good, even and especially the storms of our own making. I have experienced this. I know it to be true. And if you have experienced storms in your life, storms attached to sin, I imagine you have learned it too. There are times when you run away, when I run away from God, when we act in defiance of God's will. It may be that we are going through a difficult period and we can't see God's presence. And so in our sense of aloneness, we act out. We often don't talk about these things that we do, these things in our past that are an embarrassment to us, but we know they're there, and we know that we paid a consequence. God threw us into a storm, and that storm didn't just hit me or hit you, it hit others near us as well. And it may have been deeply painful. It still may be deeply painful. When we're hitting, when we get hit by a storm, a mighty storm, we usually can't see through the ferocity of the storm. We can't. But God can and God does. Indeed, With hindsight, probably most of us can see that that mighty storm that came upon us was actually a good thing. At least it carried something good for us. That there was mercy in it, as hard as that mercy was. And so it drew us back and changed our hearts. Jonah could not see at the time that deep within the terror of the storm, God's mercy was at work drawing his heart back to God. It's not surprising that Jonah missed this initially. He didn't know how God would come into the world to save us. But we, who live on this side of the cross, we know that God can save through weakness, suffering, apparent defeat, and failure. Our own disobedience. It's what this table is all about. God's saving love came into the world through suffering, so his saving grace and power can work in our lives more and more as we go through difficulty and sorrow and failure. When we miss it by this much, and when we miss it by this much, there's mercy deep inside our storms. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I invite you to stand and join me in in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed and Please note the phrase towards the bottom of the creed, the phrase, the forgiveness of sins. Let us affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. And sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God has graced us with many gifts. One of the greatest gifts of all, of course, is just the gift of love, the gift of mercy, forgiveness, compassion, understanding of our frame, our human frame. We give thanks and we respond through our giving, the giving of our lives, the giving of our gifts. So let us do that now as an act of worship. You may be seated. Please be seated. Well, as we come to prayer and the celebration of the sacrament this morning, I'd like to share a few uh, concerns. First of all, last week I mentioned uh, Scott Jordan, and uh, I mentioned that Scott is a, a, a police officer down at Southwest Community College. Um, and that, he, but I, what I forgot to mention was that that uh, Scott is the father of Andrew Andrew Jordan, um, who is a member of our congregation. Uh, he graduated from high school last year, and we celebrated with him. So please keep Scott and and uh, Andrew and the, the family uh, in your prayers as uh, Scott moves through his his difficult journey with cancer. Jerry Cromer, you've probably heard, has um, been diagnosed with abdominal aortic aneurysm, and he will have surgery on July 19th for that. Uh, many of you know Kim Cleaver, a good friend of Joan Flynn's and, and others here. Uh, Kim's 30-year-old nephew, Taylor Monk, was playing basketball on Thursday or Friday this last week when he suffered a serious heart attack and he was taken to an ICU in Roanoke and I don't know any more about that right now. Do you, Joan? Yes. Uh, he's been on a bench and they turned it down and he's taken a few breaths on the bench. He's been in 
Okay, I'll catch up with you later about that. Uh, Olivia Young uh, is related to some members of our church, and she is 15, and she suffered a heart attack. Um, so please keep Olivia Young in prayer as well. Other prayer requests this morning. Yes, Kim? I've got a prayer request for the family of Charlie Rutherford. He lost his battle with cancer uh, a week ago. And his wife is Kathy Pyatt Rutherford. You all know Kathy. Okay. For the family of Charlie Rutherford. Charlie lost his battle this last week. Yes, Debbie? Yes. Where is Jerry? Bristol Regional. Bristol Regional. Okay, Jerry Vensel is at Bristol Regional receiving dialysis after a, a part, partial leg amputation for diabetes. <laughs> What's that? I said I may have some good news. Yes, yes let's have some good news. Oh, that's excellent. We rejoice. We rejoice with her yeah. and you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Lord, for the choir. Well, let us let us now sing our preparation hymn for communion. We'll sing it seated. We come as guests invited. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. As we just sang, this is the pledge and seal of heaven, the love of Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you.
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Eternal God, our Creator, it is right, it is a joy to give you thanks and praise. For you have given us life. You have given us second birth in your spirit. And when we go astray, as we often do, because of your love, you do not reject us. When the storms of life come, often because of our own mistakes, failures, we have the assurance, the promise, that you can use our failings, our mistakes, our sins, that you can use them for our good. Always, always, because your love is steadfast. And so, oh God, we praise and thank you. We remember that in compassion for all, Jesus healed and taught, challenged and comforted, welcomed and saved. He formed a community promising to be with his disciples wherever two or three were gathered and sending them on his mission of hope and healing in the world. Jesus trusted his life to you and he went freely to the cross for our sake. And so we remember and we take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you have given us and we celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Christ Jesus. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that The bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Holy Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are his own, that we may be one in ministry in every place. O God, we Lift our prayers on behalf of those that we have named before one another today. For Olivia, for Jerry, for Scott and Andrew, for the family of Charlie Rutherford. And there are others, O God, that we hold close in our hearts. We lift them up to you, asking that your healing, your mercy, your comfort be with them and unfold them. Oh God, give us strength to serve you until the promised day of our resurrection when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory through Christ our Savior, who taught us as his people to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are told in Scripture's tradition that on the night of Jesus' arrest, that Jesus was in an upper room with his disciples in Jerusalem. 
And that there, he took bread. And he gave thanks to it, gave thanks for it to God and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. And that after the supper, he took the cup and pouring it out, he said, this is a sign of the new covenant sealed in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Friends, whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do profess the saving death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose people we are. Thanks be to God. You are invited now to take your capsule, your communion capsule, tear off the film off the top, and let us break bread together symbolizing our oneness in Christ. And as the disciples shared the cup in the promise of their forgiveness in Christ, let us now drink the cup, the cup together. Let us join in prayer. O oh, gracious God, thank you for these gifts, these very simple, small pieces of bread and juice that speak volumes of your love for us May we be renewed in our covenant relationship with you through these gifts. And may we go forth as your people with the love of Christ in our hearts. In his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is This Is My Song, hymn number 340. Let us stand.
us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord look kindly upon us and grant us peace this day and forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.